Okay, great. So we're going to talk about security and integrity in our online courses. So I am an academic consultant here at Brigham Young University. On our campus, we have over 30 languages that are taught regularly and up to 70 languages that are available to be taught. Um, a, close to 70% of our student body speaks a second language, so we do a lot with language stuff here at BYU, not just on campus, but online as well. So we have 46 online high school level language courses and 36 university language courses that we administer online. And those are administered through um, our continuing ed uh, product called Independent Study. Independent Study has been around since the 1920s and back in those days, of course, they weren't online courses. They were uh, the, the old kind of distance correspondence type model where you mailed a lesson in, you got feedback, they mailed it back to you and so on. Now everything's online with Independent Study um, and we've been learning quite a bit about uh, these issues of integrity uh, in our language courses. And so hopefully today you'll learn some fun things about that. So first of all, I want to discover from you, just type yes in the chat if you have ever caught a student plagiarizing, if you've ever been unsure what to do about it, if you have ever administered exams in online language courses, if you've ever been unsure about exam security. And actually I'll add another one if you have ever been caught plagiarizing, because even faculty sometimes plagiarize inadvertently. Sarah, what does it look like coming up in the chat on that? A lot of people are saying yes, unfortunately, yes, <laughs> and yes, 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 lots of yeses, unfortunately. Okay, okay, so we can all commiserate together, and maybe today we'll find some ways to address that. So my objectives today is that first we'll explore plagiarism in language courses, uh, also testing in language courses and rolled into that is kind of that cheating element and then some ideas for proctoring. I'd also like to take some time at the end to discuss what some of you all have tried or frustrations, needs, and questions that you might have. And hopefully by the end of this, you can identify something that you can do at your institution to improve security and integrity. I love this little quote from the novelist Stephanie Klein tell the truth or eventually someone will tell it for you. Um, we experience about 100,000 enrollments in our online courses every year, and we have discovered that this little, uh, this little thought from Stephanie Klein proves quite true. <laughs> so let's start by talking about plagiarism. Um, at Independent Study, we have some general institution-wide policies about plagiarism. First of all, maybe we should just even explore what plagiarism is. On our um, course policies page here at Independent Study, and you can all navigate to that link if you want to, we detail out um, what plagiarism is and what the policies are for getting caught. So just to make sure that we are, oops, we are all on the same page here, um, Plagiarism is not just copying and pasting text, right? That includes close imitation of language and thoughts, failing to cite properly, and even loosely summarizing content in your own words when it's just a little bit too much like the original author and it's not um, really completely using your own words, then we're, we're crossing into the plagiarism zone. In our courses for independent study, each course Defines, defines plagiarism and explains our plagiarism policy. And it also refers students to our academic honesty tutorial. And this is just a little screenshot of it, but it's essentially a three minute animation that talks about what plagiarism is, why it matters, and some examples, some common examples. So here are our institutional policies regarding plagiarism. And I think a lot of uh, institutions have policies. This may be similar to yours or may not be. Uh, in a minute, I'll share some information with you about what we've discovered as a result of um, having our policy. So our first offense, students fail that assignment, but they're allowed to resubmit for $10. And that fee is largely to pay our instructor to grade again and to cover some of the overhead costs. 
Um, if the plagiarism is extremely blatant, then we don't give them an opportunity to resubmit the assignment. This is very rare, but I did see um, an example of plagiarism that came in one time where the student had copied and pasted exactly from A Tale of Two Cities. Um, there was nothing besides those exact words. So it doesn't happen often, but when it's something really blatant like that, then they just fail the assignment. Um, not only that, but our um, support personnel also email a letter to the student and the parent, and they also snail mail the letter. Um, they explain the plagiarism policy and the definition of plagiarism, and if plagiarism, plagiarism continues beyond that, the students will fail the course. Um, also, we do have students who work at their own pace, so sometimes they turn in multiple assignments at the same time. If all of them have plagiarized content, we just count that as one instance. We don't say, oh, wow, you turned in four assignments, they're all plagiarized. That means you have violated our plagiarism policy four times and now you fail the course. No, we just count it as one instance. When there's a second offense of plagiarism in the same course, the students fail that assignment and fail the class. Now they can re-enroll in the course, but they pay a tuition every time they re-enroll. So that can become, of course, quite costly. Um, we, in rare occasions, have students who petition for an exception. And um, to my knowledge, every time that a petition has come back for a plagiarism violation, um, it has been denied because the plagiarism was very clearly, you know, it wasn't like, oh, I didn't know what I was doing. It was very clearly uh, the student had you know, overtly plagiarized. Um, how do we find it and monitor this? So as I mentioned, we have a lot of enrollments that come through independent study. Most universities probably don't experience that kind of volume of enrollments. So for us, it was really a scalability issue. Um, we've implemented Turnitin software in, now we have it actually in all of our English courses. We've just completed that. Um, and we also, in our training for instructors for our online courses, we um, familiarize them with some of the common websites that students use to plagiarize, and that kind of helps them watch for plagiarism. So Course Hero is a common one, Quizlet, Sparknotes, Yahoo Answers, Google Translate for language courses. Um, but when the instructors get familiar with these websites, they can see things that have been posted on there for, in fact, they even have things for BYU independent study courses that have been posted on some of these sites. So when the instructors are familiar with that, then if they see it popping up in their course or in a student submission, then obviously that helps them kind of be more proactive. Um, they also watch for writing style changes and they check Google for copy and paste type stuff. We're also starting to use Turnitin actually as a proactive measure. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with Turnitin, but essentially a student uploads their essay or whatever, and Turnitin runs a plagiarism check and then returns a report to the instructor. Um, historically, we've used Turnitin to catch instances of plagiarism. Now we're implementing it so that students can actually run it their essay through Turnitin before they submit their assignment. So as a proactive educational measure, and um, we've begun piloting that application of Turnitin in three of our English courses. And one of the faculty just recently contacted us to say the instances of plagiarism coming in have significantly decreased. Like she noticed it was such a significant decrease since three months ago we started using Turnitin as an educational tool for the students. So um, that's, that's something you might want to try. Now, in our world language courses specifically, we've um, implemented that little tutorial where I showed you the screenshot. But we also, as we developed that tutorial, we wanted to work off of a conceptual framework that's tied to just kind of integrity and honesty. So I'm going to show you this little clip, which, um, which is kind of our conceptual framework. Okay, are you seeing the behavioral science guys screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Are 
It turns out lying is the natural order of things. We put 15 high school kids into a tempting situation to see if they'd lie. We told them we wanted to test the relationship between height and coordination. That was, in fact, a lie. <laughs> First, we measured height. Next, we invited them to toss bean bags through three holes of decreasing size. And to make it more interesting, we told them we'd pay them $3 for each bean bag they got through the smallest hole, $2 for middle sized, and a dollar for the biggest hole. And to make it tempting, we asked them to track their own scores. And you see where we're going with this. Mm -hmm. But to keep it scientific, we used a hidden camera to watch what really happened. Watch this kid. Here's his actual score. And listen to his report. What was your score? Three threes, two twos. That's a 240% lie. But this young man claimed that out of a possible $15, he had earned... What was your score? 16? Yeah. <laughs> All told, 80% of the subjects lied. And the irony here is that most of these subjects had just finished a Bible study class. So what's going on? Are these just bad kids? Do we lie just because we can? Here's some BS you can use. When we and others lie, we typically attribute it to a moral defect. Well, I do. <laughs> I think either I'm evil or more likely he's evil. We watch others tell lies, and we think they must just have a cankered soul. The psychologist Albert Bandura suggests much of our problem isn't moral defect, but moral slumber. In other words, we're capable of making good moral choices, but we just aren't thinking about this choice as a moral one. We're morally asleep. You know, this is a pretty big idea, because if it's true, we need to spend less time judging each other and more effort alerting each other. But would that work? Next, we brought in 15 more kids and gave them the same instructions. The only change this time was we asked them to promise to be honest. We assured them they were on their own, but invited them to indicate their commitment by signing an honor code. That's the moral wake-up call. Now, watch what happens. Here's the star of the high school basketball team, a boy named Jake, and he scores! And he reports... Six. He faces humiliation with honesty. In this condition, the results were reversed. This time, 80% told the truth. That's staggering. They traded money for morality willingly. So what's the point? Many of our moral lapses aren't conscious, but mindless. It isn't that we compromise our conscience. It's that our conscience is asleep. It's left the building. We can make the world a more moral place by simply judging less and talking more. We can assume others just aren't aware and give them and us a moral wake-up call. A little nudge to invite them to bring values they already hold to a specific decision. But you have to do it in the right way. Not a lecture, not a command, a polite reminder, preferably prior to the moment of decision. Well, let's say you're getting an estimate for a car repair. Don't shy away from saying, it's very important to me to be treated fairly. May I have your word that you will look out for my interests? There's a big message here for leaders. If you aren't frequently infusing workplace decisions with appropriate moral meaning, you and your people will likely drift off into moral slumber. So you have two options. Either offer moral wake-up calls or invest more in auditing. Are we back to seeing my slides? Yes. Okay, thanks, Sarah. So that moral wake-up call is something that we've invited faculty to introduce into their courses in various ways. So one way that we institutionalize that in our world language courses is we develop a tutorial to educate students what plagiarism looks like in world languages, that they can use online resources as a benefit, but not to replace their own work. Um, and we help them understand the appropriate use of online tra translators. We should be using online translators for isolated words, not for entire passages. And then that call to moral principles. So in the course orientation of every world language course, we offer that non-threatening call to moral principles, that kind of wake up call to just say, thanks for being honest in this course. It makes you a better person, something like that. Um, one of our instructors 
has put a tagline on the start page of every assessment that says, on your honor, you will do your best. I know, you know, something to the effect of, I know that your honor is worth, you know, doing your best and not cheating kind of a thing. Um, we also point out just some of the common tools that people refer to, again, as a benefit and a resource, but that should not be replacing um, students' original work. So here's an example, Korean 41, our first year Korean course. You can see here's our course policies page, and here's the plagiarism policy, which we already uh, talked about a little bit. So this is in the beginning of every course. And, um, and in this course introduction is where they talk about that, that moral wake up call. So does it make a difference? All of these policies and this kind of proactive approach with Turnitin and our little plagiarism tutorial. Well, we've been doing the tutorial for almost a year and here's what we've gathered. Student reactions. Uh, when they got their first warning, a lot of times the reaction was they thought plagiarism was only copying and pasting direct text. Once it was explained, almost all of our students have opted to redo the assignment. Repeat, repeat offenses, there have been very few in the same course after the first warning. Parent reactions. Many think that plagiarism is only copying and pasting. So interestingly, the parents were, have been kind of as in the dark about plagiarism as some of the students. And the teacher reactions have also been really interesting. Um, they say the resubmissions reflect improvement. A lot of times they see more thought that's been given on the, on the, to the assignment. And um, teachers feel like students are actually having greater learning experiences by going through this process of redoing their assignment. So uh, we are going to keep going forward with this. Um, before I move into exams, any questions or thoughts about plagiarism? So taking a look in the chat and maybe not to go too far down this rabbit hole, but we did have a few people comment about the uh, $10 um, fee to have something reassessed. Just out of curiosity, how did that come up, the $10 fee? Sure. Um, really, we wanted to make it very low cost, but we did want there to be a cost associated. One was just to cover the overhead, right? So um, when a student is going to retake an exam, they have to call or retake an assignment or anything. They have to call our customer support. So obviously there's a staffing you know, uh, element there. And then our teachers actually are paid per item as they grade them. So when a teacher is asked to invest their time to grade an assignment again, we felt like they should be paid again, but not the complete payment because they've already seen this work more or less a first time. Um, so when our administrative team decided to assess that cost, we wanted to keep it, you know, not ghastly cost, but something that would um, cover kind of our baseline expenses and also kind of help students think about, oh, I want to be careful because I don't want to have to pay money to do this assignment over again. Thank you. Okay, anything else with uh, plagiarism? I have a question came in. If students do their oral exam online, so for example, using something like VoiceThread, I can notice that they are not speaking but reading aloud. Is that a kind of cheating and how should we react to this? Yes, I think, um, I'll, I'll talk about that here actually as we get into the exams, but we have experienced that as well and um, when you can tell that they're reading. One of the ways that we have tried to combat that actually is that moral wake-up call. So before an oral assessment starts, the instructor will say something like, as a reminder, in our exams, of course, no notes are allowed, and I expect this to be your own work, and our oral assessments are designed so that they're not a recitation or performance, but that they're meant to be a proficiency-based dialogue. And so the instructor will kind of talk through that too. As a reminder, I don't want you to recite something that you memorized to me. I want to have a dialogue based on our speaking props. So that seems to be helping. Um, when we first started having oral assessments in our courses though, it was a significant problem where students who are just reading 
they're, you know, okay, I wrote out the answers to all of the prompts and now I'm just going to read it. It does seem to be much better now that our instructors are taking that kind of proactive moral wake up call at the start of every exam. So let's talk a little bit. Oh, go ahead, Sarah. Was there more? Oh, thank you. I just wanted to mention that we will have a Q&A session at the end of this and we can definitely continue to hash out the discussion. Thank you. Okay, great. So let's talk a little about exams. As you know, cheating happens. It happens in the classroom and it definitely happens online too. Um, one of our biggest concerns at independent study that we hear from instructors as well as from parents as well as from kind of those skeptical about online learning is this the person who really did the coursework how do we know how do we verify that well in our language courses we have um, formative oral assessments that take place one-on-one -on -one. so before the final exam but throughout the course and in those formative assessments um, live web conferencing software is used the student has to turn on their webcam and show their ID with their name. So as they're taking these formative assessments, they're learning that their identity <laughs> matters, right? And instructors can tell right away if, oh, they're acing all of their written assignments, but they're doing horribly in their oral assignment, something's amiss here, right? Um, independent study has a policy for final exams that is designed to help address the question of is this the person who did the coursework. So a high stakes written final exam or final project is required in every course and the exams are proctored and students must provide proof of identity. They also must pass the final exam to pass the course. So for example, if my twin sister did all of the coursework and I went in to take the final exam but I failed it, I still fail the course. So um, items in the final exams are often limited response or selected response and often computer graded. Um, however, we have in our language courses, many of our language courses have um, short answer or free response questions and the instructors find that they can often catch cheating in the written exam just because the students don't demonstrate the same um, output as they might have or as the person taking the course might have during the course. So in our language courses, we actually have a two-part two final exam. And students must pass both parts of the final in order to pass the exam, as well as in order to pass the course. So the oral final exam is asynchronous online with the instructor, just like those formative assessments I was talking about. Students must show their ID and enable their webcam and then the instructor acts as the proctor, so they're responsible for ensuring academic honesty during the oral exam. And then the written exam is scheduled and is in person with a certified proctor. And written exams can be in two formats. They could be paper or online. So paper format we use especially when orthographic assessment is taking place or when there's absence of a language keyboard. So for example, all of our Asian courses, Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, take place on a paper format because part of their assessment is actually forming the kanji, for example, or having appropriate um, orthograph. So those are handwritten responses to free response questions. There are some drawbacks to that, of course. It requires that a paper version be mailed to the proctor for the student to take. So there's, it takes a little longer for students to get their final exam score. Um, but we do notify students in the course syllabus that the exam is available only in paper format, that they should plan additional time for processing. And if they want rush processing, there will be additional fees. So the reason we make that really clear in the syllabus is we run into students who are taking an online course independently because they want to hurry and finish up this last requirement for graduation. And so, um, as I'm sure many of you have experienced when students are in a self-paced course, there may be a tendency to pace uh, heavily toward the due date of the course and lightly toward the start date of the course. And so what happens is maybe a student is rushing and trying to get all of their coursework done quickly and get their final exam done quickly and then they realize, oh no, I have to take the final exam on paper and it's gonna take 
X number of days for me to get my results back and that's not soon enough for my graduation deadline. So we try to make that really clear in the syllabus. We also make that really clear in our exam page. For the rest of the language courses, we deliver the written portion of the final exam in an online format. So whenever feasible, we use a downloaded keyboard. We have various proctoring sites where they have language keyboards downloaded. Um, we also provide additional characters that students can copy and paste. So it's a little bit clunky for a free response question, but they can, for example, copy and paste an umlaut or a schwa or whatever for, uh, this is an example from a German course. Of course, the benefit of the online format is there is no mailing, there are no fees for rush, exams don't get lost in the mail, there's an efficiency of processing. However, there is also the construct validity question, which is, are we testing their language ability or are we also testing their computer fluency or their computer ability? Um, so we try to um, be really careful about the instrument and the items in our online exams to ensure that um, it is construct valid. Any questions about exams and kind of how we've approached that? So taking a look, um, looks like we don't have any specific questions about exams as of right now, but we can always continue the discussion afterwards. Sure. Okay. Well, let's go into proctoring then. Um, our broad independent study policies for proctoring, every exam must have a certified BYU independent study proctor. And so paper exams are mailed to the proctor site with a prepaid return envelope. So the proctor acknowledges that appropriate facilitation took place, that there was honest completion by the student, they sign a paper, when the student completes their exam, they return it to the proctor, the proctor inserts that paper, and that gets mailed back to our processing center where it runs through the Scantron or it gets sent to the instructor for grading or whatever. Um, in our online course, uh, in our online exams, there's a unique password that's delivered to the proctors via our um, secure proctor portal. So it's just emailed, but it's a specific pro uh, portal that they log into to access the email and say, okay, here's the code for, or the password for this course. So the proctor acknowledges receipt of the password, and then they actually type the password into the student's computer, which then opens the exam for the student. Um, we're also currently piloting online proctoring services. So you've maybe heard of ProctorU or Proctorio, I think there's one called Free Proctor or Proctor Free or something like that. Um, so we are piloting a, a couple of those proctoring services. And um, the reason being that some proctored sites, for example, Sylvan Learning Centers or um, other sites where you might have a proctor, sometimes those proctors charge a fee for you to take a test with them. And um, in some courses, especially in university courses where maybe they have two or three proctored midterms plus a final, we don't want those proctor fees to become onerous for students. And so um, we're trying to increase the ways to provide a secure proctored environment without it being a heavy financial burden on students. Um, I don't know if any of you have explored online proctoring at all, but it is fascinating the reports that they provide. So things such as um, the students looking away from their screen. Um, they have to lock down their computer so they can't navigate to other windows. If the student is looking down a lot or looking somewhere away from the, the camera, it will flag them. Um, if there are significant delays in the student response, it will flag them. Um, so there, I think there are a set of, I don't even remember how many criteria, several criteria. And with the proctoring service, you can go in and say, yes, we want a flag for these criteria. And it's check boxes, yes or no, for I don't want a flag if the student looks away from the camera, but I do want a flag if the student tries to open another window. Or I don't want a flag if the student pauses for a long time, but I do want a flag if the student looks away from the screen or whatever it might be. Um, the student also has to, with the online proctoring service, the student has to show, uh, their camera has to show around the room and the area directly surrounding the student. So you can see like there's not a person right there reading the answers to them or, or whatever it might be. Um, so we have just finished 
um, over spring summer, we uh, collected data on our first 500 enrollments using the online proctoring service and we evaluated the quality of the reports from the proctoring service. And it is, um, it is really, these services are really quite good actually. And um, so far, I think all but a couple were false alarms. So the student might have looked away or something. Then we have evaluate the exam to see if it seems like there's evidence of um, cheating. We also compare that to all of their scores on their previous assignments and assessments and any other possible flakes that the instructor might have noted throughout the course. Like, it seems like in my oral assessments, the student is reading a text but trying to make it sound like it's their own words or something, right? And so sometimes instructors will put notes in the course that kind of flag the student. So we look for any of those flags to also then compare against whatever came from the, the proctoring service. Um, I would say our primary goal with proctoring, whether it's an online service or in-person proctors, is to ensure the integrity of the exam and um, the security of the exam and the integrity of the student taking the exam. Um, you don't always catch everything because as we know, sometimes proctors are a person sitting in a room not really watching everything a student does. Or maybe the proctor doesn't read the proctor instructions carefully and they don't notice that it says no calculators allowed and the student brings a calculator to their math test or whatever. Um, one of the ways that we try to address that issue of like is proctor is the proctor really a good proctor is our certification process so our proctors actually have to be recertified every year um, and once they are a certified proctor site they have to ensure their they have to you know sign for their validity with every test that they proctor um, let me, I, I don't know that there's much else to say about proctoring. Um, and maybe this, this is actually a good time now to just talk about, um, we've kind of explored the plagiarism, exams and cheating and options for proctoring. So this might be a really good time to now talk about things you've experienced, ideas you have, questions you have. And I will, um, I will if you're interested in these resources, if you wanna go look at some of the policies Independence City has, or even request demo access of a course, that's the um, website. And if you want more about those moral reminders from the, the behavioral science guys, that's um, the link for that.